Thank you very much, Heather. Um, obviously, I'm super excited to be here. I will say this is the first conference I have ever spoken at that gave away motion sickness patches. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk a little bit about serverless technology. Um, this is not just for startups. It works really great for startups. So what I'm going to tell you a little bit about is my startup journey. Um, not some of the startups that I've been with, but specifically how we used serverless technology in my current startup um, to good effect. Um, I'm not going to be quite as entertaining as, as Debbie, so I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but I am also a, a Microsoft MVP now since applying for the conference, so I'm very excited about that. Um, programming language is ABC++ if you're interested, and Martina and I also wrote a book on accessibility this past year. So, so what is serverless? Um, obviously, anytime we host applications, they're run on servers somewhere, right? So what is serverless? I like to describe this by explaining a little bit about what it is not. So in a traditional world, we have all these things we have to deal with. We have physical hardware. We have operating systems. We have networks. We have all the security concerns. We have to build and deploy software. We have the code that we write. All these different things that we have to manage to get our software that we're building to an end user somewhere. When we virtualize our machines, now we don't have to worry about the hardware as much, right? Maybe we don't have to worry about some of the network routing, but there's still most of these concerns are still there. They're still between us and deploying our software into the world. So we go to the cloud. And now there's all these things we don't have to deal with. Uh, somebody else maybe is responsible for applying security patches. Maybe somebody else is worried about the the, the network routing and, and dealing with all the hardware. We don't have to manage any of that stuff anymore. Um, one of the interesting things is that we no longer have capital expenses for all the hardware and the things that we're buying up front. Somebody else is taking care of that. It gives us a little bit better, maybe, pricing model. But then we can go serverless. And in a serverless world, we're really focused on our software what we're building, letting somebody else deal with our infrastructure, letting somebody else deal with everything that's not our code and our product and our build and release cycle. And so serverless takes away a lot of things that we no longer have to worry about. Specifically, serverless gives us a few things. Your systems can scale dynamically based upon the load. That's an important component that serverless systems all share. And that means that in a cloud infrastructure, if I need my system, my solution to scale, I don't know how many users are going to be coming. Maybe it's five. Maybe it's five million. I have to predict that and in advance allocate the resources necessary to support that load. In a serverless world, we do that differently. First, the load comes, and then the system scales up to handle any additional load that is required. And we also scale by function or feature rather than scaling the, app the entire application up and down. So if maybe one specific feature that we're working with has more demand than others, it can scale separately from everything else. That's both more efficient and cheaper. And we only pay for what we use. Uh, you don't pay for idle time with serverless. That's somebody else's problem. Um, if people are using my application and getting value out of it, then I'm getting billed for that. And that gives us a lot of really interesting opportunities, especially when you're working with a, a startup, to potentially uh, take advantage of that for our upfront costs and price and control. So there's a few different things you may hear in relation to serverless. One of those is functions as a service. Functions as a service is actually just one component of an overall serverless architecture. That may be something like AWS Lambda, for example. You also hear about backend as a service. Uh, similarly, this is just everything behind your front end application that you don't have to mess with. Um, 
But honestly, third-party services share a lot of the same, uh, they, they meet the same qualifications as serverless. So a lot of times when you're dealing with third-party APIs, you can treat that as serverless as well. So essentially, serverless is things I don't manage that handle the load for me automatically, that I'm only billed for what I use, et cetera. Anything that meets those criteria is, is uh, serverless. This is the point. Serverless allows me to focus on building my application, not so much the deploying, the scaling, the hosting, and the operations of it. So this is where we get into my story <laughs> part of this, and that is FlexiPark. FlexiPark is an idea that was born in 2015 by my father-in-law, who was driving around one day. Uh, he had a bunch of camera equipment. He's an amateur photographer, so he had a bunch of camera equipment in the back of his car, and it was raining, and he was trying to get to the venue, and he drove past three empty parking lots that were all posted, no parking. And he said, we need to solve this problem because they're right there, they're empty, nobody's using them. We need to build a startup that takes advantage of that. And that is where the idea for FlexiPark comes. So the application basically lets people come in and check for parking. Uh, you can check in, you can register your vehicle, and you can manage, the, the owner of the property can manage the property and can do some basic enforcement. And so these are the features that we knew we needed to build into this system. In a past life, if I was going to build a system like this, I would have started by creating the APIs. I would have started by thinking about, okay, let's build a database, let's design our data model, let's build everything out on this server, let's build all these endpoints, and then we'll worry about whatever else we need to do. But when you're launching a startup, you need to think a little bit differently. And so, we approach this a little bit differently. But here's some considerations we had when we were trying to decide how we're going to approach this problem. The first is that we knew we needed to keep things simple. Um, we wanted to be able to move very quickly, right? Time is of the essence. When you're starting a startup, you need to be able to test ideas. You need to know if they're going to work or not. You need to very quickly be able to iterate on those ideas and change direction. You need to be very agile. And whatever we chose, it needed to be cheap. We didn't go out and raise a million dollars to dump into our infrastructure and our architecture. We were going to be self-funding this thing. And I, honestly, I wanted to develop the whole thing, ideally without spending any money on infrastructure, and worry about those costs once we were live and in production and making money. That's the best case scenario, right? I don't want to spend money until I start making money. And so these were the things that, that factored into our decisions about how we were going to approach designing and building a brand new product. So that's the beginning. It was HTML and CSS, essentially. That was really all we did. And so we built a UI. We designed the user experience. We tested it. We worked with it. We figured out how it worked. We got it in front of people who could actually see it and use it. Um, we actually, there, there's, as we started building it out, it was an Angular application. We used some local storage if we needed to, to hang on to things so that you could interact with it. And so you have this fully interactive application that doesn't connect to anything. It doesn't do anything other than what you can see. But that lets you move very quickly, right? Because now I can put it in front of people. I can test it. I can test the user experience and I'm not being bogged down by deploying to the Apple Store. I'm not being tied down by changing the APIs every time we decide to change how something works, right? I literally changed the HTML. That's all we had to start with. What's the first integration we did? Well, this is a one-liner. We all know this. It's just Google Analytics. Why? Because you need to be able, if you're going to put this in front of people and let them work with it, you need to know what's happening. You need to be able to measure and track at least that level of activity, right? But that's simple. That's just an HTML integration. It's really easy. But at some point in time, you're going to want to actually take and store the information you're generating. You're going to need to, to have some data. And so it became time to start looking at some platforms. And we didn't approach this saying, oh, we're going to go serverless. 
we're going we're gonna to check off all the buzzwords as we build this application. Uh, that wasn't it at all. It was, what is the most expedient way for me to store data without me personally having to manage servers? Because I, quite frankly, am a terrible sysadmin and I hate it. Uh, and so there's a lot of options, right? Um, Azure wasn't as big of a thing at that point in time, but Amazon was certainly popular. And I was just kind of assuming that I was going to use Amazon. And uh, one of our friends who was, who was working on the project with us said, hey, at work, we just started using this thing called Firebase. And it's basically a JSON data store in the cloud. Perfect. That sounds easy. Let's do that. <laughs> and that's what we did. It was expedient. It was, it was free to get started. It was an easy integration, and it, it stayed out of my way. So we did that. Now, instead of having to use local storage on the device, I have a remote storage that's shared between all the different applications, and now I can actually save data. We're almost ready at this point to go into production, which is scaring everybody in the room that knows anything about security, but that's OK. Um, there's a couple other things we have to do. The first one is, of course, authentication. We need to be able to track who the users are. It turns out there's a lot of serverless solutions for this. There's a lot of third-party services you can use that will manage authentication for you. Um, in our case, it turns out Firebase does this. I'm like, this is fantastic. I chose this database because it was the easiest thing to do, and they provide authentication services to score. Um, but there's a lot of other solutions as well. And then, like, okay, now we need to store this somewhere that other people can get to it because just loading it off of our laptops and our own personal mobile phones isn't going to cut it anymore because we want to put it in front of people. And it turns out Firebase provided hosting too. Um, honestly, the other hosting we had talked about at this stage was um, actually using GitHub because they're just static files. You can use literally anything for that. Um, it just needs to put static files out and because we're serverless, right? PayPal. So I wanted to be able to take money from people. That's a very important thing for us to do. And in order to do that, you have to write code. You've got to have servers. So I'm like, mm, PayPal has a front end only integration which means that somebody could click a button and they go to PayPal and they complete the transaction, they come back to the application, and I don't have to have any backend code at all to do that. So we did that. And you know what we have here? We have a completely production-ready application. It's not great, there's some UX problems with, with PayPal as a payment method, but it works. We have no backend code at all, zero, zip, zilch, nada. We have a data store, we have our authentication, all third-party services. We have our hosting. We have our payments. And we literally went into production and started taking money this way. No back-end code at all. In a world where normally I would have started by building the databases, building the data models, doing all this stuff. And this was a learning experience. This is a way that you can put the users first. You can make sure that you're solving your users' problems, that the problem that you're solving makes sense. You can iterate very quickly. So there were a lot of really cool things that came about by doing this. Again, we didn't set out to build a PWA. We just decided to start web first because it was easy. It was expedient. It allowed us to move very quickly. We didn't intend to be serverless. It just kind of worked out that way. Um, today, I definitely recommend thinking about serverless first. But now there's some reasons we might need to go ahead and have backend code. One of those is, of course, security. Um, Firebase specifically provides a whole system of, of rules for your data, for your files, to help protect you. Um, but there are situations where you really need to run code that is maintained securely. Um, Another one is potentially performance. There are some situations where it is very good performance-wise to push something out to the client's device and let that do all the processing. But there are other times where it makes sense to do the processing closest to the data. And of course, data integrity. 
Anytime you do data integrity on a client's device, you're running a colossal risk. So you absolutely must be able to have data integrity verified someplace outside of the user's control. And so for these reasons, we started adding Cloud Functions. Cloud Functions on Google or Firebase are the same thing as, I think their serverless functions on Azure and their Lambda functions on AWS. Basically, it is a small unit of code that scales independently, that can be deployed independently, that does a very small function for you. In our particular case, we use this to improve the payment processing, which was probably the worst user experience at that point in time. Uh, it's essential to do that because all payment processors require a third-party handshake from a server in order to manage security. It's, it's essential. And so that allowed us to integrate uh, Braintree for payment processing. Uh, and then later we wanted to be able to take files. We want users to be able to upload files. They're going to take an image of their car to register the vehicle. Um, we, want it, we wanted the parking lots to be able to upload logos and images. And so you need a place to do that. But you know, there's cloud storage. Amazon S3, you've got storage buckets in Google Cloud, Firebase. And now I still don't have any infrastructure. I've written code, I'm storing files, and I still am not maintaining any infrastructure. But <sighs> users run into problems sometimes. Sometimes things don't work the way you want them to. You need to be able to track everything you're doing. That's very important. So we actually, I met uh, Todd Gardner at KCDC a few years back, and I went to one of his talks, and he was talking all about problems that small businesses face. And he talked a little bit about Track.js, and I'm like, I need this. This is fantastic. And we started using Track.js uh, pretty shortly thereafter. And Track.js integrates to the front-end application, and anytime errors happen on the user's device, Track.js tells you what the error was and every step they took leading up to the error so that you can reproduce it and fix it. And that was a, a huge win for us in being able to improve our user experience, to fix any issues, to know when we have problems with authentication or with the payments or anything else, uh, and provide the best possible user experience. Again, third-party service integration. I need to know what's going on. I need to track all these things. How do I, I've got this like, very virtual infrastructure. How do I know what's going on? Uh, Google Stack Driver, there's a lot of other tools. There's, um, I'm going to completely blank on a couple of the other ones that I've evaluated, but there's a lot of analytics tools that allow you to connect to all these different services and view all at once what resources are being used. Um, Google provides dashboards on how much money you're spending, for example. Added backups. Um, Google provides backups, but that felt just a smidge bit risky to me. So one of the things that we started doing is every five minutes, our entire database, it's a JSON data store, our entire database gets exported and sent over to Amazon S3 to a secure bucket. Why? What happens if Google decides to can Firebase? They've canceled less valuable projects before or more valuable projects before. Um, do I want to have all my eggs in one basket? No. So now all of our data is out there. So if I have to rebuild this, yes, it's going to be a pain in the butt, but everything that I need to come back up is on somebody else's infrastructure. So one of the things we wanted to do is if somebody takes a photo of their car, uh, we wanted to, that to be good enough for registration. We don't want them to have to type their license plate and make and model on their phone because that's just a barrier to entry. It's, it's a pain for the user and it's really stupid because everybody carries a camera in their pocket. And so we did that for a long time just by uploading the image and then if we needed to we would manually extract the data and type it in. And, and so uh, I was actually meeting with uh, some investors last year and I told them, yeah, we now extract all that data uh, so if somebody takes a photo of their car, we extract the license plate, the state, the make, the model, the color, all that goes straight into our database so that we can search against it. It's like, wow, how much did you invest in, in machine learning for your team? I said $20 a month. 
What? There's a service for everything now. Uh, in, in, in this, this era of, of serverless software and third-party services, you can buy almost everything you need and aggregate other people's services and still generate a lot of value and create products that nobody else has created just by using tools and, and, and frameworks and systems that other people have built for you. And so we did this using integration platforms. And here's four popular ones. We use Zapier. So the cloud functions in our situation will respond to various application triggers and then immediately send that data over to Zapier and say, here, do whatever you want with it. And if you're not familiar with these tools, the way they work is essentially a very nice user interface to say, okay, I want to expose an endpoint. I want to accept these data fields. And then I can say, it, it, it's a workflow. So I say, I want to do something with this data. So I click the plus icon and I say, I want this user data to go to MailChimp as a subscriber. And I just connect to MailChimp and I drop, drag and drop the data. And now my contact information is going straight to MailChimp. Maybe I also want to track this in a CRM. Uh, fine, add HubSpot. The contact information goes into HubSpot. We decided to switch from HubSpot to Pipedrive. Not a problem. Delete HubSpot, click plus, select Pipedrive, boom, all that information is not going into Pipedrive. And I can do that without writing any code, without deploying any code, without changing anything about my application. Um, so these integration platforms are fantastic. And they allow you to do these really great integrations very easily. Um, it's not always the best. They're not free. There's a cost involved in that. At the same time, I don't have to write <coughs> integrations. And some of these integrations are brutal. Um, so that, that allowed us to move very quickly. It allows us to change things dynamically. If I need to change something about how I integrate with a third-party service, I can do it in five, 10 minutes. It's almost free to make those changes. If I want to send transactional data into an accounting system, I can do it. That integration already exists. Literally, all I have to do is export it from my system. I have to write, write and deploy one cloud function and design the pipeline in Zapier. An hour, two maybe. And I can deploy a completely new feature and I can do it without touching the main application that the users touch. Right? I don't have to deal, I don't have to interfere with the, anything the users are doing. I don't have to touch a single line of code that's already been deployed, which means I also don't have to regression test anything. And so this is a very nice way of building modular software that works independently. And so we ended up with this complete system now, built from the front end back with very little code operating anywhere other than the user's device, just enough to provide the data in integrity and the security that we needed to provide. And we, we collect all the data, right? We know everything that's happening on the user's device. We know when they run into errors. We know which features they're using more than others. We have, we're tracking analytics. Um, authentication. We can allow Google auth. We can allow Facebook auth. We can allow usernames and passwords. And I didn't have to write any cryptography code <laughs> because that's bad. And so there's things that startups run into when you're launching that this helps with. So one of the big startup challenges is talent, right? We have to hire somebody that is skilled in everything our company does. So the fewer things our company does, the more people are able to be interchangeable, maybe the fewer people I can hire or the more redundancy I can have. If I can hire four front-end developers and they can manage everything, that's better from a startup standpoint, from my perspective, than hiring a, a front-end developer and a back-end developer and a system administrator and a database administrator because now I've got four completely different skill sets that I have to manage, each of which doesn't have any redundancy. Um, costs. Uh, all startups struggle with money. No matter how much money you've raised, you tend to find ways to spend it. So anything that you can do that allows you to manage your costs in a startup is really important. But it's not just startups that deal with this. 
most big corporations, when they're trying something new, they tend to give real, kind of sometimes very small budgets for the proof of concept. And you've got to be able to demonstrate tremendous value. They might follow that up with a billion dollar investment if you can prove it, but you've got to prove it often with a very small budget. So this is very important. Um, we need to be able to scale. It's really hard to know sometimes how well a product is going to take off or just as importantly, how quickly it's going to take off. Um, and in, honestly, some, some projects, some applications that I've built that have been very high value have had like 20 users, right? That's, that's the, the sum total of the user base. Uh, but it's very, very, very important. Uh, and others, I mean, you'll run up to millions of users a month and I don't have to, I don't want to have to guess that because I don't know until after it's happened. And then finally, tech changes fast. <laughs> uh, we actually started working on this project in AngularJS. Um, Azure basically wasn't a thing. React basically wasn't a thing. Um, so the technology changed radically from the moment we started to the moment we finished to, to today. And in general, when you're a, a technology company, you've got to make choices that allow you to keep up with the pace of change of technology. So the reasons that serverless is a good fit for these things is that you have fewer total skills that are needed, uh, which gives you a larger talent pool, among other things, and lots of redundancy. Serverless, from the, without us having to do anything special, by definition, allows us to scale costs. We only pay for what we use. So if we, if we plan carefully, we can actually design our revenue model for the company around this to guarantee that we don't spend money unless we make money. And we've been able to do this, which is pretty exciting. It means that our basic operating costs were covered by like month three without any problems because all of our infrastructure costs scale at a much slower rate and with our revenue generation. We want our resources to be sufficient to demand without having to predict the traffic. In other words, we want to always serve every customer that comes without any problems, but I don't want to have to guess how many that's going to be. Uh, parking is a very seasonal business, as it turns out. It's very weather dependent. If it is a really nice sunny day in July, people are going to come out. Um, if there's a big event, you're going to see a huge spike in traffic. I don't want to have to monitor the papers to know every single event that's going to happen near one of our parking lots. I mean, we try to do that for marketing purposes, but if I had to do that for technology planning, that would be prohibitive. And we want to choose technologies that are easy to learn, quick to build, and cheap to discard. It needs to be very cheap for me to decide this doesn't work, I'm going to go in a different direction. I need to be able to delete code or cancel a feature or change a direction in the easiest way possible. And particularly for a backend infrastructure, if you have independently deployed functions, that's super easy and it doesn't even impact the rest of the application. So we don't have to manage our infrastructure. We pay for what we use, we scale automatically, and it's a very fast time to market. And that is my story of serverless and how we use serverless with FlexiPark. So thank you very much. <laughs>